Tonight's film is Voices of Abused Children, and that film will be presented by Mr. Francis Joseph. So I'd like to um, invite Mr. Felix Wilson, or oh, I am Kimon Joseph, the Marketing and Outreach Officer at UE Open Campus, so those of you who don't know me. And I'd like to welcome Mr. Felix Wilson, our acting head, to give you a welcome. And then we'll begin with the film and then move from there. So Mr. Wilson. Okay, thank you, Ms. Joseph. And um, how do I welcome people who have already welcomed themselves? The fact that you are here um, in a population of 70,000, I would have expected here to be jam-packed. But those dedicated souls as yourselves are here. And to you, I extend the most hearty welcome to the Open Campus. You are very much aware of what the Open Campus, or the University of the West Indies Open Campus, represents. And as Ms. Joseph made mention of the word outreach, we are reaching out to the community in all different ways. From, you may say, um, from Calypso's to where usually some Calypso um, workshops and functions and debates are held here to very academic exercises, which is our remit as a university and the fourth campus of the University of the West Indies. Um, I do not and I cannot say that I can speak to the voices of abused children, but you know that is topical and you have heard so much about it. Um, and I never hesitate to say, even in my own church, that is the Catholic Church, you have heard many um, stories, um, whether true or untrue, alleged um, molestation of young people, boys and girls, etc. But that is the malaise, you may say, of the world. It's not only confined to one church, or which is my faith, but it is the malaise of the world. And um, I think Francis Joseph, our, um, what would I say, the, not featured speaker, but um, co-director of this film that we are about to see, a 45 minute film, will um, tell us uh, much more. Um, I should also tell you, because it will not come as a surprise, this is being filmed by Mapping TV and SAT, so we welcome the, the um, press. But to say that, this incidentally forms part of the UE and U program, which we had to have had last week, but because of the, um, well, the tightness of time and many of or some of our staff possibly falling ill. Uh, it may have been chikungunya, I do not know, but I'm saying to you, that fret um, did disrupt a lot of activities at the University of the West Indies um, last week. Um, usually on the third Thursday we have this UE and U program. But what will be recorded here by Mapping TV um, is this entirety, that is the film, what you have to say, Mr. Um, Francis Joseph, some of the questions asked, it will be compacted, and we will then present it as a UE and U um, program. So once again, um, I think the expert will tell us about um, voices of abuse. He's no longer a child, huh? but has, you may say, that child passion. Having worked with the Children Fund, it was it, um, for many years, and having studied in the field of um, uh, child welfare, and one social welfare, and once uh, the chairman of the Early Childhood um, Council of Dominica, which it doesn't seem to exist anymore, is just in name. Um, and um, I always remember when the UE tried to get on board to be a partner in that council. That was where, when one may say, Kai Pool Kwasi, uh, nothing happened after that. Mr. Joseph, you can confirm this. But um, what Dominica should always be engaged in is open discourse on all topical issues, all issues that affect our existence, and that will continue, that was there before, you may say, and will continue to affect humanity for many years to come. We must and should address, I see in the crowd here, um, Jacinta Banis, 
of the um, national anti no, I almost said anti-doping, um, but drug aware. Um, yes, but she's 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 also that. She calls herself secretary and treasurer of the National Anti-Doping Organization, um, but more so drug prevention unit manager. Um, I see other esteemed persons here, um, like Miss Mrs. Wicks, yes, who you know led a campaign on um, getting many persons. She never came to me, although I asked her um, um, for me to sign that the age of consent should be raised to 18 um, from the meager 16 it is where people are not very well developed and cannot take and make decisions at that tender age um, they can do so better and it would be in sync with what is universally seen as um, you becoming an adult at 18 and beyond um, I also see some young persons and he reminded me he's young although um, he has had um, like myself uh, an airport for many years. That is Afi Mate at the back. He describes himself as young. So if as Afi is young, I am approaching my youth. Okay? So that puts two of us in the same boat, you may say. Um, but the people who are going to be doing the rowing tonight, Miss, um, Miss Joseph, Mr. Um, Mr. Joseph, and Mrs. Wicks, I also um, welcome you as the facilitators and let us have an enjoyable evening and be open as the campuses in asking questions pertinent or not thank you very much thank you mr wilson and i'll call on mr joseph to just give a short introduction to the film and then we'll begin the film and we'll give him a chance to do a, a lengthier presentation afterwards Good evening all, and thank you Kimun and Felix for your presentations and introductory remarks. Um, I want to say that every time he talks about kids, I'm a bit nervous because of, of what goes on. So I want to say a special good evening to everyone who's here, and at this stage, my family who is here also after we've just buried our mother yesterday, and want to kind of, you know, wait give tribute to my parents, my father who passed away just a couple of years ago, and my mother. And I only grew up knowing about child abuse. As a child, I never knew what that word meant. I never came across it and so on. So it tells you the kind of environment that I grew up in. I want to appreciate all those who are here in the field and recognize those from Child Fund, Jillina, even before she joined Child Fund, where I think I initiated her change of professional base but at the same time even while she was in child in um, at the welfare division we work closely together in addressing the issue of child abuse there are some students also who are visiting and many others who are here i appreciate you being here and so on and one of those mentors on the radio that i listen to pastor rodney we give each other a lot of guidance and inspiration um this i just want to also indicate and make reference to steinberg henry who is not here with us this evening, who played a very instrumental part in, in um, getting this documentary going. This idea of voices, the address, the name of it, Steinberg and I discussed, and we came about voices of abused children. Before, while planning, while on the field, and while editing, we are hearing things, so we're wondering what is it we are hearing. We are hearing voices. So we said it's voices of abused children. Um, this, this, this initiative was instrumental by UNICEF when they called me and they really wanted to do something. And uh, in Child Fund, we got Child Fund on board. We got other agencies involved because it's never one agency thing. And collaborating is very interesting. And we got the Caribbean, then Caribbean Child Support Initiative. And the Bernard Vanler, then, who funded the Roving Caregivers Program through the organization I worked with. It, took some time planning and working with Steinberg, who is exceptionally professional and exceptionally qualified. Although I knew what I wanted, he advised all the way through in his professional way by listening and putting it into context. So I really want to give him some tribute for that. We did that documentary in three Caribbean islands deliberately, in St. Vincent, in Dominica, and in, in, in Antigua. 
Antigua gave us more of a problem because we were wondering if we would exit the country with the information that we got based what, when we met a government official, what was said to us in the sense that you may not be allowed to leave this country with some of the findings that you may have got. It was a high-ranking person in the welfare division. So on our day of departure, when we asked, we said we forgot and we have to book our departure date. So we did not reveal when we were leaving. We were due to leave that evening, and we had the cameraman with all the documentary and all the evidence, change his flight. No one knew to depart Antigua in the morning, while Steinberg and I stayed in Antigua for a couple of hours. So, that's, <laughs> so those things, you have to be aware of what is being said. And uh, the documentary itself will tell you a lot. I don't want to say much. I will elaborate after it. It's about 45 minutes. Please enjoy it, and uh, we'll get into a discussion after that. Yes? Thank you very much. Once the child has been abused, we should investigate. Don't allow our children to be abused. Don't let them think that they need to, in order to survive in this world, they have to give away their bodies or sell their bodies for a bus ride or for a meal or for a hamburger because that's what a lot of them have been forced to do. I asked him one time with my daddy. He said that he's the one who married me and the body is, is going to take my fortune. It is shocking to me and most disheartening and painstaking to see such children sometimes undergo such treatment. And if they talk about all the rights of children, the right to education, the right to food, the right for health, children need love and attention. We got to nurture them. Children are gems, they're jewels. We have to treat them that way. sponsor of this project. CCF's mission statement makes it a clear supporter of this project. CCF creates an environment of hope and respect for needy children of all cultures and beliefs in which they have opportunities to achieve their full potential and provides practical tools for positive change to children, families and communities. Caribbean Support Initiative, Bernard Vanille Foundation operates as an intermediary resource project which will bring peoples and resources together to enhance parenting capacity and knowledge in the region. All children appearing in this documentary are protected. Children from St. Vincent were secured for the Family Services Department and the Christian Children's Fund. The Dominican children were secured for the Welfare Department and the CCF. A wonderful collection of Antiguan teenagers gathered at the Isle of Lee, having received permission from their parents. They were accompanied by attorney at law Joanne Messiah. Children have a right to expression. When a child is speaking, nobody else is speaking until they're finished. My rights are to be clothed and fed and to be kept taken care of, to be taught how to be right and the wrong of the world. I think we need to be listening to the world. What are the rights? Where did all this come from? This Convention on the Rights of a Child, it was adopted by countries of the United Nations. A synopsis of those rights of a child is captured for us by UNICEF's Abu Bakr Saibu. Children are human beings in their own rights. Therefore, they have human rights. 
even if they are not always in a position to let them know or to defend them. Children's rights are not opposed to parents' rights. On the contrary, they reinforce parents' rights by making families stronger. Rights to me have always been there for about the children but adults. We think about the whole question of human rights, but we don't marry it with its brother or cousin a lot of times. It's human rights and social justice. What does social justice say? That people should be equitable along every social strata. My human rights says that I have a right to life, an inherent one, inherent one too. I have a right to an education, I have a right to family, I have a right to a home, I have a right to lots of things. In 1990, world leaders at the World Summit for Children launched, set out, articles for the protection of the rights of the child. For example, Article 34, the state shall protect children from sexual exploitation and abuse, including prostitution and involvement in pornography. As part of the process of implementation, all countries were to launch a global movement for children and present country reports every two years. The global movement for children is a call to leadership and action on behalf of children everywhere and at every level of society. It is a call to ensure that every child is free to grow to adulthood in health, peace and dignity. That global movement is guided by a 10-point imperative. Imperative number five is central to this project. Imperative number five, stop harming and exploiting children. The violence and abuse that children suffer must be stopped now. And the sexual and economic exploitation of children must also be capital of St. Vincent in the Southern Caribbean. St. Vincent is about 150 square miles with a population of close to 120,000. It is one of three countries that we will visit to hear the voices of abused children. The other two being Dominica and Antigua. There are many manifestations of abuse, physical violence, abandonment, but Voices of Abused Children will focus on Article 19 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Article 19, the state shall protect the child from all forms of maltreatment by parents or others responsible for the care of the child and establish appropriate social programs for the prevention of abuse and the treatment of victims. Under that particular article, it is reminding us again that this is why our children need to be protected from every member of the society. And not necessarily when, when a wrong is done that the legal person says this or the social person says this or the doctor says that. But all of us have responsibility to ensure that these wrongs are not committed. Every time I think about it, I even talk about it, it saddens me and I become very emotional when I have to talk about it because it really is on the increase. We find incest forever being on the increase. And just last week I got an anonymous letter, not last week, Monday actually I got an anonymous letter reporting that a 11 year old child was sexually molested by her stepfather and she became pregnant and they had taken her to have an abortion and the first thing they let was asking me please to go to the home. Now that is difficult for me to do because all this is alleged. I cannot go into a home and say well I heard such and such and such so we have to take that and start a tender hoax. Marion House, a private institution, provides support to government's family services division. A few years ago, we had a sad case where a child was being killed for $100. He had lost $100, so you know, he was murdered again. To give the parents a joining, it came across not only from Paul, but also a source of ignorance. I didn't know any better. 
I can't replace my child for $100. So we had, you know, that was just one of those very overt cases. We also have the, the sexual abuse in all its forms, whether it's rape, whether it's incest, whether it's molestation, you just fondling the child for, again, for your own gratification. That too comes across from a source of power. Things happen around St. Vincent and the Grenadines that I do not like and like the killing, so the homosexual, so and all them different kind of things so that school should not be happening in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So. Maybe I can start from 89. 89 sexual abuses, we, has, we had 35. In 90, we had 21. We had a drop. 91, we had 33. In 92, we had 29. In 93, I don't know what happened, but it went up 70 cases. 94, we were pleased it, went, it was decreased. We had 41. In 95, we had an increase again, 60, 96, 55. 97, we went down to 37. And I'm pleased to tell you that in 98, 23, 99, 22, 2020, and 2001, 23. So I feel that we're doing something. Now those are sexual cases, and I must remind you those are reported cases because a lot are not reported. Parent education will continue to be of critical importance in this fast-changing social environment. We've been running a parent in education program for the last 12 years where we seek to enhance parenting skills of parents age 15 to 25 because we seem to find difficulties occurring homes where parents again are saying that the children are not communicating, they have they're acting out, they're growing up right under their very noses and they don't know how to respond to what their reactions are. It have times where um, parents will tell their um, daughters, um, you have your period to play boys. What what can they understand by that? You're supposed to get in details and show them the reason because playing, telling them playing with boys, they might think, why can't I play with boys? What going to happen if I play with boys? Because I'm afraid I cannot play with boys, you should tell them straight, well, you cannot have sex when you, when you start seeing your period because there's a possibility that you can get pregnant. don't really want to get into it, like they want to get out and they are forced. Well, it was my aunt's husband. Well, I was in the room watching TV and after he called me and was like, what? And like, he was like, that's something to tell me, so I um, well, the comments tells me, call me, and after what I went, he hold me tight and didn't want to let me go. And I was like, let me go, let me go. And he was like, um, no, he won't let me go. So I was just going to say, and after um, he went, he pulled me into uh, my aunt's room, he locked the door, and after he went, do you have two doors? So he locked the first one and after he walked the cover and locked the next door. And after he, I was like, what are you going to do? And he, he was like, um, nothing, just relax. And after he hold me tight, squeezed my hand, and put my wrist wrong, and told me to be quiet. And after he pushed me on the bed, and, and he had fell. Couple more because I was like screaming and uh, making all sorts of noise and just took off my clothes and uh, well, I was scared, terrified, and I was in a uh, pain and felt bad. I'll be dumbfounded, I'll be shocked, I'll be amazed. Because here this person, person is doing this to me to, to become as if I'm, I've already taken the journey to hell and on my way back again and going back again. That's one of the things that Howard does when it comes across you in such a very destructive.
victim manner, that you feel less than a person. And it's all in case of the victim, male or female, who believes that it must have been something I did wrong, why this was done to me. They didn't look at me as a whole person, as probably looked upon as a tool to be used in any way somebody please. So how do I step out from this feeling whole, like a normal human being again? I can't hold my head up anymore, because when I pass the street, people will say, wait, 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 that's probably the little girl or the little boy who was in court. That's the girl for sure who the stepfather or the father molested. And how do I deal with that? We're small and it's not ordinary for small people to be doing those kind of things. And if it's not ordinary, if somebody forces you to do it, right, it's even worse. It's just, it's just wrong. They're wrong. We also have it from the top. We have a lot of sexual molestations from bank white collar jobs, bank managers, right, right across the board. They have the TV, they have the Nintendo, they can go on a holiday every year. They can go, when they pass common entrance, they get a trip to Disney World. They have it. But yet, a lot of molestation, sexual molestation, takes place in these homes. It's not reported because poor mommy goes into denial because that stigma that would be attached to her, having to leave her husband and leave all the material things that they have, the holiday abroad in France or wherever, the children can't go anyway. So she goes into denial, that poor child just sings. It destroys the child either completely, or the children come very rebellious and defiant, and it's up. the whole family becomes dysfunctional. On the grounds of the Holberton Hospital, St. John's Antigua, we found a child and family guidance center, a subgroup of COPE, the Collaborative Committee for the Promotion of the Emotional Health of the Child. This we found rather innovative, something close to what was happening at Marion House in Kingstown, St. Vincent. When I think of child abuse, I think the thing that comes to mind is a child. I see a child who is being introduced to something that they cannot handle. A child's psyche cannot process uh, sexual activity with another person, particularly a uh, trusted person. Dr. Albertin Maturin Jurgensen is Director of Psychiatric Services in Antigua and was instrumental in the establishment of COPE. The child's psyche, the child's mental capacity, the child's mental life cannot really process sexual activity, cannot process what goes into a sexual relationship. As a kid, I think sex was gross. You see, the kissing and air. You just think of a child going through school. You know, when learning is introduced to a child, they can process it, especially when it's done by a very good teacher. They can move from understanding mathematics into really complex type of um, learning of mathematics, but they cannot. The child, a child psyche, it was not created to be able to process sexual activity. COPE is an NGO set up in 1987. Among its many functions, the organization provides support to parents and families. So you're always on the go, as a parent, you're always on the go. And what you may find, the parent is pushed to the point where, because they cannot manage the child, they will lash out in different ways. They will punish them with all different kinds of things in order to try and get through to them to get them to stop what they're doing. And it doesn't always work. So as a result, you have a lot of children who are presenting with even bruises. They're, they're being beaten with all manner of things. You know, we had a five-year-old, no, he was actually seven-year-old, who was admitted to hospital. The father had really lost it, and you know, he just beat him, he beat him, he beat him. His face was just really a mess. But that was, you know, it was, the child has since been diagnosed as having attention deficit hyperactivity, but the, the, the parent needed help. Astra Allen works also as a counselor at schools. In my first week back at school in September, I think within the first week, I had, um, I think, two suicidals. Um, they just had enough. They couldn't take him anymore. They just wanted to kill themselves. I had um, children who were being punished and were 
separated from their main family who they had known had been sent into a different culture as a form of a punishment, they were very distressed and you know couldn't manage the separation, didn't really know what to do. It was a new culture. You had children who didn't know how they were going to age. You have a, a whole range of things. So I think that not a neglect and the physical aspects, I see that more so from the school's point of view. We do have quite a bit of that here at Cole, but we have more sexual abuse than we have the physical. Recently, a new sex culture emerged in Antigua, threatening the dignity of the child. For instance, the government has set up a committee to look into, it's a task force on child pornography and prostitution. And we have been, me I'm a member of that committee, and we have been meeting focus groups, right? And one interesting thing that I will, I was impressed by the, the focus group for the elderly women. They explained to me, look, this thing is going on long, long, long time since we were a little girl. Children do not introduce themselves to pornography. This is adults sucking them into this activity. And I think that it's adults using children, you know, using children for their sexual satisfaction. I think that the people who commit, commit these crimes should be disciplined, dissipate severely. What um, we've heard rumors of is of young children after school being taken into various localities and places and um, maybe videotaped with their clothes off and very provocative sexual positions. In Antigua, there is a group of women who call themselves POWA, P-O-W-A. The professional organization for women in Antigua and Barbuda. They gather here for meetings at the Island Inn in McKinnon's, just outside St. John's. Allegations of a pornography ring in Antigua caught the attention of POWA's Kevin Mockinson who shares a chronology of snippets with us. We began the chronology on the 15th of September 2001 when police hold two suspects for questioning in a case of an alleged pornographic and prostitution ring disguised as a modeling agency. It involved several underaged girls. The nation was shocked by media reports that a 13-year-old victim had brought this matter to the attention of her aunt who then reported it to the police. The laws of Antigua and Barbuda expressly prohibit media identification of alleged perpetrators and of sexual offenses. So we were not privy to not even a hint of who these people could be. Our national hero, Sir Vivian Richards, spoke out against the child sexual scandal. That day, that evening, Power launched a petition to the Prime Minister to revise and strengthen the Sexual Offences Act so it could provide better protection for our children. That morning, the Prime Minister announced the formation of a task force to analyze the root causes of child pornography and prostitution. From about April, just until the beginning of September, about eight cases have come into power as a result of um, just, you know, expressing is discussed at the whole pornography issue. And with those cases coming in, those eight cases have been reports from April to September, reports, and they've been followed through. Now, if one small NGO who does not specialize in that um, issue can get that many cases being called in, how much more established agencies over a period of a whole year. Why is it our records are showing a small amount of number? Powell met with the Prime Minister and his delegation, presented a petition with nearly 9,000 signatures. At this juncture, it is critical that Article 34 be repeated. Article 34, the state shall protect children from sexual exploitation and abuse including prostitution and involvement in pornography. There was hope for power when on January 29th, Justice Ephraim Georges sentenced a 43-year-old father of 13 to 20 years in prison for committing incest. 
and then he take off my pants with an accent. But he's doing that. He said that he started telling me that it's long time he loved me and he wanted to have sex with me. And I asked him, why you guys is my daddy? He said that he is the one who mind me and nobody is, is going to take my fortune to It's not the first time. He, he did not do it once. He did it three times. Before they do something to after December, he did it February again. I tell his mother and I told the welfare and told my teacher. And that same day, he beat me and I ran up my leg and I was sick. So the day some welfare came up and saw my leg because it was swell. And then she goes, she left. And the third time now, I went into my, I went in for myself to the police. One of the factors that are operating there is the fact that some fathers do not think it's wrong to have a sexual relationship with their daughters. Uh, and it's, it's the whole thing to about not considering sexual uh, interference of children as anything wrong. Uh, this is my daughter. If it can be kept secret, it's okay. Um, it doesn't hurt her. What am I doing? Is she going to develop fever? Is she going to develop cancer from this thing? Is she going to die? And so that is part of the reasoning behind it. Um, there are still some societies and communities where fathers feel they should break in their daughters. My father had a father in Antigua tell me that um, if it's anybody, he's the best person. He, he wasn't involved in incest, but if there, if there was anybody to introduce his, his daughter to sex, he was the best person because he would know how to do it gently. He sat by side of me, me chicken to the ground, and I fell. He forced his cell on top of me. Then he had four sex with me. And I was trying to get away from him, he sat in my face twice. And after, when he was done with me, he told me, if I go and tell anybody, or if I tell my mother, he will kill me. It's difficult to get children to come forward to say this has been happening to them. When you do get children to come forward, you find that there's a great conspiracy going on to hide it. Um, those who do report it now face all kinds of problems. They have to report it to so many different people. They have to keep going over this story. But it was troubling me. It was troubling me. still troubling me after, say, two days. And I say, you will have to kill me. But I need to tell my mother. So I told her that she couldn't believe. So she brought me to a, a counselor. And I said to the counselor, to me, I did the right thing to tell my mother. At Bayabu in St. Vincent, we asked a group of 10 teenagers to tell us about communication with their mothers. And that was just in case they were abused. I will go and talk to the nurse, the nurses, because I live right just with me. I will go to someone in Hawaii to come talk to my parents, but we have a better communication. And he can speak with somebody, like the school counselor, and the school counselor can speak with you head principal who can report that back to your parents or bring your parents into it seeing that you can speak to your parents and then from there on you can just take it as a joy. There needs to be a protocol. What should happen when a child is abused? Um, what are the steps? And, and those steps should be made as easy as possible and as friendly as possible to that child. What are the policies regarding the protection of the child? What is the status of existing legislation regarding child sexual abuse? Presently, our statutes, on our statutes, there is the Employment of Children Prohibition Act. The Education Act also forbids children of school age from working instead of attending school. The Guardianship of Infant Acts and Infant Protection Act speaks for themselves. Through the Children and Young Persons Welfare Acts, 
and children and young persons act, sexual offense act, the maintenance act, and the protection against domestic violence act, children are protected from neglect, exploitation, and various forms of abuse. Right. The, qu the problem is the legislation that is there already, they are either ignored or they are no teeth to ensure that the perpetrators are brought before the courts. And I just want to point out what a consultant had to say in answer to your question. What a consultant had to say um, with regards to the laws here in Dominica vis-a-vis -vis the convention. That consultant was uh, um, commissioned by UNICEF to do a study of Dominica's law, laws vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And, and the consultant says this, in general, the laws of Dominica are in conformity with the letter and the spirit of the convention. However, there is a lacuna between the law, its practice, and its enforcement. The same could be said in the cases of Antigua and St. Vincent. When a child appears at the health center, or even if she never went to the health center, at the hospital to have a baby, and the, the, the persons at the hospital, the nurse, the doctor, whomsoever, are looking after that child, and they become seized of the knowledge that this child is 16. It means that you have before you, presented to you, the obvious commission of a crime. Why is there not in the Sexual Offenses Act a provision which obliges persons who come to that knowledge to report such matters to the police? Obviously, you want more proof that there has been a crime committed against this child. She's having a baby. She had a baby because she was violated. You have a situation where the mothers or the guardians are aware that these children are being violated. The matter goes before the court. While the case is being ventilated, it is learned that the mother knew or ought to have known that the child was being violated, yet took no step. I would like very much to see a situation where the, the, the Sexual Offenses Act is amended to include such a situation so that a person, a mother or a guardian, who knows that a child is being violated by usually a relative or someone they know, or sometimes a stepfather in a, you know, whatever situation. And they permit this to go on, usually for economic reasons, but whatever reasons they are, they are wrong because the person knows and has condoned a criminal act. And such persons must be made culpable under the law. We can't just close our eyes or do like the parents whose daughter was molested and go in denial and say it's not happening. I see no reason why a stepfather has to sexually molest his daughter, his stepdaughter, or a father. If you want sex, there are women all about the place. Don't, please don't destroy our children because you destroy these children for life. As relates to Article 19 and sexual abuse, there is now increased reporting. And when we look back at 85, with only five reported cases, we ended up in, 19, in 2001 um, with close to 300 cases. Between April and August 2002, Christian Children Fund received reports of sexual abuse in Dominica. 93% of the abusers were family members. Just looking at the last year's figures, that is um, 2001, we had normally the cases that are, these are only the cases that were reported to the Child Abuse Prevention Unit. What we normally do is get the cases from the police eh, and we put it to, together with and we have the total figure. But I'm looking now at only what was reported to the Welfare Division, which were already 155 cases. Of the 155 cases that were reported to the Division, 96 were sexual abuse. Eh? 96 cases. Of these 96 cases, 22 were incest. Eh? 
So you know, so that is we can, you know that is what we, we see happen. Ninety six were sexual related and twenty two were incest. Of the ninety six, sixteen were boys. So we do have a case of where young boys are sexually abused. We know because homosexuality is something which is taboo in our society. It doesn't come out easily. And I can, I can say when we talk of 96 being sexually related, we can maybe multiply that by 10. Being emotional neglect, even where sometimes they are ignored, not taken, um, no one pays any notice to them, or some very hurtful things being said to them. Um, emotional abuse is, to me, to my mind, I find it very high, but the least reported. We see only black children they, when they do not attend um, school, or sometimes also when they are they, they have some medical they need medical attention, they're not taken to the hospital or to the clinic or whatever it is. But we have neglect to in the what you would call the white collar. Where the child is given everything they may need. All the food, all the clothes, they are at school, everything, but they, the need for their parents. You know, the need for their parents to be present with them, the need for direction, the need for love. And we find that this, you know, is material things are taking the place of, of that. Boys are being abused also. Um, the male child is also at risk. And, and, and so uh, we live in a, in a culture where such incidents will not easily come to the open you know, um, because of, of the nature of the offense and, and um, the type of challenge a child would face if that comes to the open. Some of them never come back into their own. They either end up either introverts, they end up nymphomaniacs, or they're just on the street prostitutes, or they just don't care, they hate men for life. I feel like I see him and I could kill him and I could kill him. And I promise that I said that, and I'm 18, that I have sex for the first time. And I'm up to the I feel, I feel scared, I don't want to really want to go home sometimes. I know I should forget and forget, uh, forgive and forget, but I can't. As relates to developing a protocol of reporting, what is the path of reporting when a child is abused? A child tells a friend sometimes, that friend may tell the teacher. The teacher will tell maybe the principal, and then the principal might call, we call the welfare division for assistance for that particular child. And the child tells a friend, who tells a teacher, the teacher tells the principal, the principal calls welfare, and welfare gets in touch with the police. There's another route. The child tells an aunt or a neighbor, who then call welfare, and welfare calls the police. We sometimes hear of the child reporting it straight to the police. When this is done, this is brave. But seldom do we hear of the child reporting a sexual abuse case to his or her mother. For those children who have not gone and reported it, they may not have seen it as abuse. They've seen it as their mother does not provide for them, their mother does not care whether they have money to eat, they're tired of begging for food or money to buy their projects for school, their craft material. They're tired of begging and not going to beg anymore, so they don't see it as abuse, they see it as survival. So I think a lot of times people don't report because they really are not aware that it's a crime, and for some people it's just not a crime. In some families it's been a cycle. You know, you, you speak to some people, you know, or you hear conversations out on the street. And you, you understand that some persons, the entire family, especially all of the girls, have been victims of incest. So how do we break that? Where do we go? There's another institution that determines the results of the flow of information. And that's the family court. St. Vincent has one. I'm happy to say that we now are coming to get our family court family. Then at least you, know, you have the, the support system in place. You have your counselors working, you have your legal persons working, you have you know, the social welfare department, the police. So it's, we have that kind of network. Yeah. However, something's happening between reporting the case 
and the court appearance. I have heard of cases where um, children who have, where their, 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 their parents exchanged money for cases um, like this, turn around later and say, this part of the house belongs to me because it's the money you obtain that built this part of the house. So that itself sends the message. I was privy to one situation where it was the father that was involved. And the, 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 the child was sent from the country to live with her father and her stepmother. The mother was somebody who made voyages overseas and was quite happy to have the man's daughter. The mother, the, the, the wife, may or may not have known of the, what was happening prior to the, the, the mother and the family finding out. But it was the wife who came up with the $600 check and said, here, take it and let everything go away. But my question to the mother was quite willing to take the check was, do you realize that if you accept that check, you have with one soup turned your daughter into a prostitute? that she's being paid for famous render. How could you possibly live with that? I do know that the matter never went further. As far as we've observed, the Sexual Offenses Act has to be enforced in all the territories. Alex Boyd Knight makes a further recommendation. She wants a section included in the Sexual Offences Act that makes it an offence for anyone to impede the course of justice. That is before the court hearing. And what of the perpetrator? The tendency again has been in the society that we lock up the perpetrator, we throw the key. But the perpetrator also has family, also has um, friends and relatives who is especially traumatized just as the way the victim is. And we're going to have to begin to help on both fronts. When a child has been robbed of an innocence in that way, she of herself is a walking time bomb. And so that is why, you know, you say that the, 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 the um, perpetrator may need help, but the victim needs a lot of help. And one of this long discourse on sexual abuse, is it all about power? I think that another point of power is popularity. If I am popular and you are nothing, a girl, a girl would faster have sex with me than you. It's that I have absolute authority, so to speak, over you. And you are the minor. And I can do whatever you want to do, because not only do I have the power, I also hold the keys to your development in whatever form. I could choose not to feed you. I could choose not to clothe you. I have the decision-making powers whether or not I send you for an education. So you're totally dependent on this adult or this group of adults for your optimal development. I would like to point to a moral decadence. I really would like to. I know um, I'm a medical person and that one may expect to have a medical reason put forward as enough. I think it has to do with a moral decadence. Hey, 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 hey. Why don't you walk up to you and look at your daughter and say, ah, I like your earrings, lend me them. Where did they come from? You understand me? Where did those earrings come from? You'd be surprised the mother will wear those earrings to church even. <laughs> then they're responsible for the abuse or the sexual maltreatment that that particular child may have to suffer for those, those earrings. Sadly, this cycle just repeats itself. You know, the stepfather has been molesting this child. Her self-esteem has become so low. Very soon, she gravitates to a man, my, sometimes to somebody older, because she has that missing father figure in her. And she wants love because she's not getting any love. A lot of the stepfathers and even the parents to feel wants to provide three meals for a child and a shelter. That is love. That is not all. Too often, we see, I have seen this, and I know that it happens where 
an adult female or male will touch a child on her breast. Oh, you're growing, you know, you're getting big, you know, or, or they'll touch them in their private parts. And it's supposed to be okay because it's my mother. And I think the children have got to be able to reach a point where they say, this is my body, excuse me, you are not to touch me there. And they should not be uh, reprimanded for being rude. This is for their protection. Yes, I'm a mother of four. And I think mothers need to listen. You, you ask what you've been looking for. But I would say listen. When children talk and they talk about not liking somebody or not liking to go to a certain place, you should not ignore it. Do not deny that you hear it. Zero in on it and let the child speak more about it. Even before that, develop a relationship with your children. Talk with them and set up an atmosphere where they can come very easily and talk with you about what's happening in their lives. Children do want to talk to adults. When they're sexually abused, they're very distressed. They want to share it. But if they are going to meet blank faces or people that are going to chastise them or they're not going to come forward. So mothers need more than ever to develop that kind of atmosphere where children will come to them and they need to keep a listening ear out. If your child says, yes, this is happening to me, the child may come out and say, look, so-and-so had sex with me, but they're going to express a kind of fear of being in that person's company or going down to where that person is. You need to very quickly pick that up and investigate. We need to look at certain little things like, you know, we have a child and suddenly the child begins wetting her bed. She is long past that from three years and she's now nine years and she begins wetting her bed. Why? Maybe the first thing you would have to do is take her to a, a medical doctor. You rule out that something is not wrong with her physically and why? What caused that behavior? The child begins having nightmares, screaming at night, talking about strange things. He cannot sleep at night. Children who begin operating at night. We're talking about a little seven-year-old girl, Chira. I can think of now. And at night, what she does? She wakes up seven years. She washes her underwear at night because there's a funny smell. She plucks her eyebrows at night. She does, um, she has, she draws pictures of men naked, women naked, I love you and hula. That is a, that is a, a red flag. I think one of the things for me that kind of throws itself at you more often is how a child, a female child, will just suddenly bloom. You will suddenly see that her shape has just changed. She's filling out her bust to maybe a lot bigger. Sometimes there's a change in her complexion, the complexion of her face. And that could be related to the stress, it could be related to the activity, it could be related to some of the anxiety. So I think you look at their bodies. You also then look at how their body language in terms of how they move, how they sit, how they behave around certain people, especially when they withdraw themselves and they don't want to be in someone's company. Please observe what the child is saying through their isolation and their, their withdrawal. Hello again everyone. I will now introduce our presenter, Mr. Francis Joseph, and you have the information about him in the back of your program. Francis Joseph is an advocate for the protection and welfare of children, youth, women, and the family. He's currently the country coordinator for of Partners of the Americas. Prior to this, Joseph worked for 17 years as the director of Child Fund Caribbean for Dominica and St. Vincent. And his office was based in Dominica. He has produced, uh, he has successfully pursued uh, the prestigious social work course diploma at Croydon College in London, the principles and practice of social work at UWE Mona, and he holds a postgraduate diploma in social work and public administration from Brunel University in London. Joseph has lectured at the UWE Open Campus Dominica in a variety of courses in the social work and early childhood education programs. He has served as the Vice President of the Dominica Association of Social Workers, the President and a member of the Board of the Directors of Operation Youthquake, he has served as the chair of the Early Childhood Council in the Ministry of Education, as a member on the Government's Education Trust Fund, 
as a board director of the Dominica Social Security, a member of the National Education Appeal Tribunal, and a member of other organizations which promote the protection, well-being, welfare of all children, women, and vulnerable groups and families. Francis and his wife Linda have two children. So I welcome Francis Joseph now to do a small presentation before we go into the question and answers, both on the film and on general knowledge of the issue in Dominica. Thank you very much. Uh, a revealing documentary which always brings back memories and just to remind you this documentary was done in 2002 and uh, the latest news out there now brings back a lot of issues and uh, a lot of people do call in the radio stations and television and talk about what should happen what should not happen i will try to put it in perspective in this um powerpoint presentation which is what we are saying here, they are all innocent, they are vulnerable, let them grow, and let them enjoy life. And you've seen some of those messages coming from all of those that were interviewed and represented in the documentary. I want to do this because there are a number of factors and agencies wanting to come together to address, and I need to lay a foundation as to where we are and what are people asking for. This is a quote I got, I can't remember the, the person responsible for this. As advocates for social change and social justice, social workers seek to intervene at the point of need in the hopes of achieving positive outcomes as evidenced by improved levels of functioning. However, in an environment that is however naturally biased and riddled with inequality and injustice, the efforts of social workers are futile. And this is very important to note. Um, we don't have an organized social workers group here, but social workers do meet now and then to talk and to, to talk about the issues and the profession. And that in itself, if it's not been organized, creates a problem for in a professional way addressing the issues and taking it forward to attract or to, uh, to enact um, social policies and change social policies in the best way possible. The role of the non-governmental organizations, recently a group of NGOs came together and are now trying to address the issue of abuse in all forms, not only sexual, because you have people who are abandoned. I could give you examples and examples and cases of issues affecting children and families where absent fathers, visiting fathers. You have people who are fathers but are not parents and some don't want to understand that anyone can be a father and a mother but not anyone who can be a parent. So there's a big difference. So the non-governmental organizations, as we have had a series of joint meetings, we have another one sometime tomorrow morning, and we have sent out statements, and you have heard of demonstrations in the city of Roseau, which was represented of many um, NGOs on island. And we have appeared on radio, TV shows, and silent protests to stop child abuse in Dominica. Voices of Abuse Children, as you heard um, Dr. Hugginson says, a child's brain and psychic is not sufficiently developed to process sex. And that was a very profound statement she repeated to us in her office in Antigua then. So it's very important to recognize that. Um, following up on some data, and some people still don't believe that it happens, um, I'm just putting this here just to indicate it's documented that child sexual abuse is rising by months. That's the, something that came off of the uh, Dominican News Online. Cases of sexual abuse are the highest forms of abuse committed against Dominica's children this year, according to the Welfare Division. Chief Welfare Officer Martin Anthony said sex abuse cases have ri has been rising by the month and that challenge could continue well into 2011. We continue to see uh, from our records, a number of children are still being abused. We see sexual abuse topping the various forms of abuse on a monthly basis. We heard that in the documentary in 2002. We are still hearing about, we heard about it in 2011, 2014, we are hearing about it. So it's still happening and something is not really happening or something is not being done to address this scourge. Um, next. Child abuse cases in Dominica do not appear to be shrinking, and I'm giving it to you because a number of professionals are saying it, so it's been consistent. As the Welfare Division on Tuesday reported 27 cases of, for February 2000 alone, 
the person in charge now who replaced Ava McIntyre, you saw in the documentary, that's Gemma as in charged with coordinating child abuse prevention at the welfare division, told DBS Radio that most of the cases of child abuse reported last month are sex related. This comes after the division announced at the end of 2010 that cases of child abuse topped the form of abuse against children in that year. We have children right now in the month of February as young as five with sexual abuse. Five years, both boy and girl. So hearing this, I would say we have a serious problem, and that's what she says. So I don't want people to believe it's Francis saying those things. We need to understand that the professionals are talking, but some of them are not being heard. Yes. Now, the minister, uh, Gloria Shedding-Ford, said in 2010 that there was an increase of reported child abuse incidences in comparison to 29. And during the year in 2010, there were 209 reported child abuse cases, where in 29, there were 117 cases. This could be attributed to the increase of public sensitization and awareness on the issue of child abuse in Dominica. However, it has been proven that the majority of cases are factual, she said. She said the most reported from form of abuse Note that reported cases, and as you heard also from um, Eva McIntyre, reported cases, and these cases can be multiplied by 10, 20, because these are just reported cases. Uh, is sexual abuse with a total of 147 cases in comparison to 72 reported cases in 2009, an increase of 75. There is physical abuse, and the increased concern here, Shillingford says, is the one of incest. We heard of a father who has given his granddaughter, not yet a month, a year old, some level of um, SDI. Uh, in Dominica, yes. She said the trust of children in immediate relatives is betrayed since incest is committed by the children's relatives. There were 18 reported cases of incest. Also of concern are pregnancies occurring, uh, occurring due to child sexual abuse. And Alice Bodnai made reference to if those cases are presented or the pregnancy is presenting itself to the hospitals, what authority is there to build up on it and to do what? We hear about this protocol being executed well in most developed countries, but here people are scared. There is a case where I went into a remote village where uh, a teacher wanted to talk to me about an incident. And she says, um, Sir Joseph, I have something to say to you, but I do not know how to say it. Well, it's a case of um, abuse, she says. Someone reported it to me, another professional. Now, our communities are very small. And she reported that the nurse told her, upon examining a child preparing for entering primary school, secondary school, school, sorry, that in examining the child, she noticed that the child was um, interfered with. Now, the nurse doesn't know what to do with it. She told the teacher. The teacher doesn't know what to do with it. She's going back to the nurse, and now she's passing it to me, a trusted friend visiting the community at that stage. What do you do about it? We don't know. The scenario we have is the nurse is related to the child's mother, the teacher is related to the child's father, and by extension. So whoever blows that whistle, somebody and some family is going to have some issues somewhere. That comes then to the institution of our social work networking and our institution of our profession. Where are they? They are not visible, and that is really what the problem is. So you do not have people who can match in and say this was wrong, we have to deal with it. It depends on a family member. All the time to do it. So our social work system is really defunct and it's not that out there. They, they, are, they are very good professionals in there who want the resources to work and the environment to work in the best way possible, but it is not there. Okay? Um, wider interest in child protection, stages of child development. It's very critical to understand that and I'll give you a demonstration. We go through in social work understanding the stages of development of a child and it's very critical to understand that. Both to three years is nursery. The child is young. We have, to, we have had to stop many of our children, even through our roving caregivers program, Lockhart is here. You have to let the children play. We did another documentary called Play is the Child's Work. And you have to understand that, that you cannot give them a pen and paper and tell them, go and write daddy a letter who's somewhere in the garden or somewhere in Antigua. It won't work. They have to express themselves in many different ways. You interfere with a child at that stage, you are beginning to damage that child, literally. Early childhood really is a home-based thing. We, we are doing it now in centers like preschools and nurseries because our children have to go to work. So we trust that the carers in there, the preschool teachers, do the best job. 
When I came back from England, when our money was going to a lot of preschools, I noticed 99% of the preschool teachers were not trained. I looked for money all over the place to do a course. They said it has never been done before. I, however, got money, about $90,000 a year, and we did a four-year course, and so on. All the preschool teachers were challenged, and they came in for training, and we had to start all over again about not only in early childhood concepts, but give them English, maths, and um, HFLE. These teachers now, I'm happy to say the majority of them are now pursuing further and are now students and have been students here. Some have gone to Silval in Trinidad and Vincent in St. Vincent to do further courses. The importance of explaining to them the human growth and development and its protocol in the protection of children. The three to five year old, and again, it's not compulsory by law, so the, the Education Act makes it compulsory at five. However, the Education Act was amended, and there were a team of us, including myself, if a lawyer drafts, a, a legal draftsman, to put some of the protocols and the, the necessary um, sayings in the Education Act to protect as far as um, compliance and the best practices and the environment for that child to grow in. And if they're not doing it, one can be closed down. The 7 to 12 year old children begin to talk back at you. They are sponge, they take in a lot of stuff. At 12, that's when they'll start telling you, and then you want to slap them, and that's when all this kind of spanking comes on because now the child is beginning to communicate with you from what they are hearing, you don't understand, and the best way some parents talk back or communicate back is trying to spank and shout. All of a sudden, their child is talking and asking questions, and you're supposed to be that innocent thing for a very long time. Now, 12 to 16 children are old enough to go to prison, and I've seen some of them. We've seen some of them right here in our prisons, and I've seen some of them in St. Vincent and in St. Kitts. So they do, they, they, a child of 12 is eligible to be charged and can be sentenced from age 12. So you are held accountable for that period of time. 16 to 18, the Act makes reference of a transition that between 16 and 18, you are referred to as a young person, meaning you are transitioned into adulthood. So it's very important to recognize that, and the parents recognize that, that they, they have some level of independence, they are demonstrating something more that you have to be aware of. So that is why they admit provisions of that. Um, a recovering addict story. And I, I gave the stages of development to show you the next stage of what happened to a young person, even at the age that she's in now. She was abused as a child, forced to the streets at 13, and is recovering from crack cocaine addiction. Consequences interfering in the child's development. That's Christabella from Portsmouth. I have a name here because it is on DNO and it's, it's, it's all there. She slept in garbage, crack cocaine, ate garbage, and served time in prison. She has put her life back on track after how many years? What has she lost? What has she gained? Next. And this is her now and she was abused as a child. It stays with you for a long time and you have difficulty forming relationships, you have difficulty moving on. It affects those children severely and we've seen a lot of them, okay? Voices of abused children, traditional places for abuse. Principally, it is the family home. You can't run away from it. And principally, it's the stepfather and people who have access to the home. One of the things we didn't capture during that in St. Vincent, a child was upstairs doing her homework, and she heard the, someone walking up the steps. She didn't have any problem. She thought it was safe, and um, she thought it was her dog walking up. It happened to be a family member. The guy, no, sorry, he was actually in there messing around with her, and he heard footsteps, so he ran out of the door, the, the window. What saved her was a family dog that was actually walking up the steps. That's what actually saved her from these perpetrators. So their fathers, stepfathers, uncles, and visitors, and why the home is seen as very secured, mothers desperate for cash sell the children, and children are vulnerable, and they themselves are blackmailed. Who further, um, Voices of Abuse Children, who further states that an estimated of 47.6% of girls and 31% of boys in the Caribbean, who is the World Health Organization, uh, rep uh, reported that in their first intercourse was forced or coerced by family members or family acquaintances. So those things are being documented and those things are actually happening. An area of great concern in child protection is the harmful sexual culture of the Caribbean, which sanctions the early onset of sexual activity, usually as a consequence of widespread sexual abuse. New places for abuse, higher education institutions. We have heard traditionally it was the home. And we grew up, maybe from 10 years ago, we always heard. We now hear, and it's documented, that the church and the churches 
are into it with some denial and they are beginning to look at it and deal with it. Um, I have seen our parents showed me a, 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 a text. She regretted now she um, had to um, delete it from in Dominica uh, uh, education person within an institution texting her. And that child got that, that text number from another girl that this person in this education institution has been texting her as well. So at that level, it, 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 it happens. And you will hear something more. So the examples, it happens in schools, within the government services, um, law enforcement, business places, upon end of probationary period at 21 when you're coming for a job, they tell you have six months. You, you know, the time are coming up for you to be um, fully employed and to be placed in positions. We can have dinner, we can do these things, and it happens in offices and they mess around in there. Business places, former President Jimmy Carter lent support to the scourge on CNN on 13th April 2014, talking about the scourge of the. The perpetrators issue of identification when before, during the crime, at point of being arrested, upon uh, found guilty. Before the crime, someone told me that um, why is it that we cannot give their names out once they have been arrested? I explained the law says that uh, until you are found guilty, you cannot release the name. I also said to this person, we know who the perpetrator is even before the act begins, and the family knows who they are. So we know who they are already. We don't need the law to say so. Come out and say it and stop it. So don't wait for the law when they are convicted. You can release their names, you can call somebody before they get the act or if you know they do it. So do not blame the law and the police for that because you already know, most of them do know. So it's not at the point of being arrested, it's at the point when they are found guilty and when they are sentenced, legally their names can be released and so on, in Dominica. The perpetrators, the law makes provision that the name of the perpetrator is made public only at the point of guilty. My issue? The perpetrators are known before, during, and after the abuse. They are protected by families, friends, business people, politicians, and the public. Therefore, the cry for the name of the perpetrator by the public comes too late, that is, after the child is severely abused and damaged. Case example, true stories. Girlfriend assisted boyfriend, both convicted and sentenced. Girlfriend appealed, sentence increased. <laughs> Teachers targeting students from second form. We have teachers uh, summoned into principal's office, teachers marrying their students in the USA, Caribbean, some of the student teacher got pregnant, others just follow up. This case of is a very interesting one. I met both of these people in the prisons. I was doing a session on child abuse and so on, and they both, the both girlfriends sat over there, the boyfriend sat there. And uh, she says, I, I didn't know nothing much, he did it all. And I don't know why they sent me for eight years. I shouldn't be sentenced for eight years. And I appealed the case and so on. And then when I went in, they gave me two, two more years. <laughs> I said, if I was the judge, I would have sent you for another 12 years. Because I don't think you understand the implications of what you did. You facilitated your boyfriend, you got that person, and you prepared him to rape that child. And she still did not get it. So she's, been, she's, she's released now. Both male and female children are affected, including babies, infant, toddlers, and youth. Incest is on the rise in Dominican children are very tender. Ages continue to be sexually abused by family members. Examples of typical perpetrators within the family, I said it already. Unfortunately, in some instances, mothers do not protect their children from this abuse and allow it to continue, usually in exchange for financial benefits. For example, it is uncommon for mothers to accept out-of-court settlements from, it is, it is not uncommon right, from perpetrators or from child victims to be, and, to be sent overseas. Reporting perpetrators who are family members proves a challenge since this group gives rise to feelings of betrayal. Therefore, many cases of incest remain hidden. That's from Jones and, and German, and I got this from Palisa Levy's paper of 2014, you know, paper that she's preparing, um, talking about child abuse. Another true story, two ongoing cases of inappropriate advances or actions, and I got this, the source is from the Sports Olympic Association. Case one involves a male physical education teacher who confessing, confesses to molest, molesting a nine-year-old male student in the teacher's toilet, but this teacher is requested to resign by his headmistress to protect his future. What about the future of the young boy, okay? Case two involves a male coach 
who makes inappropriate advances on a young female student after her training session. Fortunately, her mother gets involved and reports the matter to the police. The coach's lawyer advises that the young female student was an adult. Okay? In the Cairo territory, this was a typical case that came across some years ago where I used the term illegal adoption and some people did not like me using the term illegal adoption because of how it happens. So we have mainly the, the Cairo territory, let me understand, that are not only Dominica, indigenous populations across the world are targeted by people from France, Europe, Canada to have babies come over as theirs. Before we started the Roving Caregivers program, I was dealing with a, a session on the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I spoke about the right of the mother, the right of the child, the age groups and the stages and so on. And after the session, this mother of 18 came to me crying that she didn't realize that she had rights as a mother and she wants her baby back. Mm -hmm. So I asked her, what do you mean you want your baby back? Well, my baby, my mother suggested that my baby be given away to this couple in the neighboring French island because they can't have children. So they will have this cuddly baby taken care of. Instinctively, this mother is as well asking for her baby because she gave birth to the baby. Very educated woman. Two years later, she had another baby, but this one was over there, and she wanted the baby back. So I promised I'll get her baby back. I started investigating what's happening. That is when I realized in the Carib territory, there is a, a business going on of a lot of people coming in, taking young children, and going with them to Martinique and Guadeloupe. I went to Matnik to the um, social welfare services and I spoke to them, I gave them the names and so on. They have nothing on their record of this child. The issue is how are these children getting to Guadeloupe and to Matnik in particular? Um, it so happens they will come, some of them who go through that trafficking, will get a, a doctor's certificate to indicate the child is sick and because they are French, they take the child over indicating they're going for medical treatment or it is in the process of beginning for some level of adoption and so on. But she wanted a baby back, she said, and she was adamant. I went, I got to know where she was staying, somewhere in Shellshire. I spoke to the social services, I indicated what's happening, but to some, for some reason they were not taking me seriously. So when I got back here, I called a big press conference. And I alerted and upset a lot of people that this scourge is going on in the Caribbean territory. It made news, people in the Caribbean, in Trinidad, they called me and I indicated what's happening. The Saint Lucia, um, the French embassy in Saint Lucia got to know about it, and uh, the the welfare division, the social services in Martinique, couldn't do anything. But they knew of the mother and where they were staying. When the thing made some news, the equivalent of CNN in France, what's the RFO? They came to Dominica. They had an interview. They wanted me to run around the island with them. I said, no, go by yourself and get your news and do that. I don't want to be part of it, so go and do it. They interviewed me. I explained what was happening. Lo and behold, I'm speaking English. It's converted into French, obviously, in the other countries. And uh, it was picked up. The French embassy in St. Lucia got very embarrassed by the whole situation, called me right away. What's happening? OK, the child will be home within five days. The mother came down with the child, crying. The same time, the so the embassy is asking me now, give me the names of all the children that you know of. I said, I'm sorry, I'm not at, at liberty to do that because I don't have the um, authorization from these families to do that, but you can investigate it. The child came back, the lady was a Baptist lady heading a church in, in Matnik, and um, she was crying that she wants a child. I said, what the person I can see tears of is the mother who was deprived and denied her child to cuddle, to nurture, and she's missing her child profoundly. I went to her mother's place, that's the mother of the child, and the mother looked at me and said, Joseph, I vex with you and all kind of things, and she gave me all kind of cool shoulders that she had, and so on. And I said, blood is thicker than water. She said she didn't want to talk to the daughter again because she's the one who helped initiate it. However, the child came back, they are bonded. They go to Matnik on holidays, they come back, the lady come down, she meet with them. So the respect for that family is there now. If the mother wishes the child to continue education in France, I told them this is what you have to do. Work with the mother, it's okay, but do it in a decent way. I've had many people since then from the Caribbean territory coming to me, they want their children back. There are many young people, <laughs> there are many young people in Guadeloupe. I try to get money to do a documentary to send some people over there to do a docu uh, uh, thing. We have had a lot of Carib children, and not only Carib, but even some in the gutter areas have been taken, but predominantly in the Caribbean territory. 
they, they, they were sent back to Dominica unceremoniously, speaking French absolutely. We had one who came back, was put in a foster home from the Cary territory in Trento, came back, they sent them to Focoli and sent them somewhere else. So they are, as I said, it affects them mentally, they are not stable. One came back speaking only French, she went to school in Wesley and she picked up quickly. I think she has three children now here in Dominica. I saw this in Bolivia, I saw it in, um, in Peru, I saw it in Honduras, I saw it in Guatemala. You go to the hotels and all these indigenous people in the foyer of the hotels, the hotels accommodate them and they are packed with mothers with their babies and their children up to two years old and you see this European passing and to take them away, to register them and to take them away to the United States, to Europe and elsewhere. So this is one of the things that, that, that is happening. So there's all of those things that, that do happen in the Caribbean territory. Right now what's happening, I do not know the details of it. But she has two children and she has a kids back. She's a very good mother, a very good couple. Right. Positive political action. I, I heard some things here and I listened with interest when this time when I heard our speaker um, in an incident and I went back then when I remember she said something and nothing has been done when there were allegations. So there are people who have a lot of mouth. That's my problem. And when they get into authority where the protected politicians are, they all of a sudden become silent and they have nothing to say. But we have been hearing cases of ministers here as well who are sitting on each other's laps and who's doing what. And maybe the forum will come when I will say so more about this. But she came on board in Trinidad and she fired this minister. And I think there were two of them she fired since, profoundly. And she said, I am taking a political risk, but I have to do it. And she did it and she fired these ministers. Don't mess around. I personally witnessed a prime minister in the Caribbean harassing a Lee at a flight attendant, stalking her, harassing her, intimidating her on that flight. I think they are trained when they are being intimidated by passengers to sit down on their seat nicely and just look ahead. I sat two behind and he sat up front. Sorry, he or she, sorry, he. <laughs> <laughs> There's one in Jamaica. Yeah. So he started in front and literally staring at the woman, embarrassing, and she doesn't know what to do. She knows that he's, he's sitting on that seat here and she's over there. So she's just deliberately keeping her. It's like, make this 35 flight, minutes flight be five minutes, please. It was embarrassing. When the flight was over and they opened up and he was walking out, obviously, the protocol came for him. He held the woman's head like this and mwah, mwah. He controlled it and she was embarrassed. So these things do happen, and I could give more stories about this place in this country, but I won't go into that. What causes this abuse and this manifestation and this deliberate insult on people? Poverty has to do with it. Some of the parents, they need money, they sell their souls, they compromise, they do a lot of it, simply because they need cash. And there's deprivation, there's exclusion, there's vulnerability, dysfunctional homes, large families, mendicancy, you have people running around asking for money and so on, it creates a lot of problems, and they are desperate for something. So all of this does it. Okay, next. And please, thank you. <laughs> she was not there on her own, guarantee you. There were adults around and they were just accompanying her. So we're saying that she was in a safe environment and she was engaged and so on. This is the story of voices of abuse children in Dominica from 2002 to current. I think her boss is the best person to ask that question, to be honest, her boss. But we haven't heard of any initiative along those lines since that office. I guess it's a prestigious office and you have to be careful 
how you address changing national policies when you're trying to keep order, order, order in the, in the, in the House. So we have not heard of any initiative since then, after that, these pronouncements that she's made in protecting families, advising women who are vulnerable and their children. Um, no, we have not heard of anything being done as far as that is concerned. The, the one she's making reference to as well, and we know of a business person very much so, the, the child is, is, is going home, gave her a lift, uh, diverted, went to the home and abused the child, and we know that one was going to the court. So that person is a very prominent person as well. And we know at the point on the 11th hour, the mother, as the witness, turned it down. It's alleged that uh, she got some financial gain for it and not to pursue. So those things are, are happening, and a lot of people do get away with it, yes. Okay, the comment I wanted to make is that um, I'm a victim of child and sexual abuse. Right. And one of the things that happens is that you think that you're the only one, right? When I was in high school, um, I don't know if we were playing a game or something, but it came up like maybe like a truth or dare. And they said, when, basically like, when did you lose your virginity? And it was very surprising and revealing that everybody was like your first virgin or your second virgin. Because the concept is, the first virgin means forcefully, and the second virgin is voluntarily. So I think one of the issues, I don't know if that's the case now, but I mean, it's been happening so long. I think one of the problems is that a lot of kids carry that baggage with them, and they think that, that they're alone. And really and truly, when you look at the statistics and you realize, like, there are so many other yeah. people that have that issue, you know, it's crazy. And another, another thing, I didn't really see it touched on in the piece, but one of the other issues is that when you're abused as a child, um, maybe if it happens when you're like seven or six, because that's when it happened to me, when it first happened, um, maybe it's just, you go through the motions, I guess, you know, it's just something that's been done to your body, you know it's wrong or whatever. But when you get to like the 11, 12 year old, your body starts to like react. And so you find some type of pleasure in there. Mm. And so the confusion comes also when you know that something wrong is happening to you, but at the same time, there's like a good feeling that comes from it. And so that's where some of the shame and the embarrassment comes from because you, I guess you think that people would look at you as, you know, a slut or, you know what I mean, if you, if you express that you are going through that. So sometimes when people talk about a young girl, like, I won't name any schools, but when I recently came back from studying and people were saying, um, you know, this lesbian thing that's going through the high schools, um, my first thing is like, well, did you look further than the surface, you know, because to me that was like saying, okay, there's a sign right there that something is wrong. So I think um, people in the community, in society, need to not look at the surface things and just label young people. You know, when you see somebody acting out, because with me, I, I was a very good student, so it, I was able to cover it, you know, but I ended it on my own. Like, I, I, I realized at a certain age that, okay, this thing that's happening to me is wrong, and I told the perpetrator, you know, like, you cannot do this to me anymore. But I was a good student. I, I, I guess I found refuge in sports and music and all these other activities. But some kids, um, I guess, they act out instead of you know, finding something to focus on. So instead of looking at them as problems, you know, we need to like, go deeper. Yeah. That's my country. Yeah, I appreciate you. I really appreciate you standing up here and, and doing this. It's, it's usually very difficult for support groups to come out because it's like they are all of them, people see them. Um, but it's, it's finding your own comfort and how best to deal with it and who is the best person you can talk to and how to pursue it. And uh, obviously you sound like a very mature person. Let me compliment you on pursuing your education and moving on with it and being strong. But you, as you are saying, it will remain for a while and you have to know how best to deal with it and surround yourself with people who can understand what you're going through. Yeah, it will pass, yeah. So they will see you. Yeah. Hey, how are you? What's up? How is your mother? You yeah. Know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Y
forget. Never forget. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, and I want to commend the young lady uh, very, very highly. Probably we should begin to speak to a few others who, who, who have found themselves in this unfortunate situation. Francis, I have a real problem. And I'm hoping that probably this, this forum and, and maybe others could be a platform to address it. Uh, you have the abuse like you know our, our friend just 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 explained but uh, this society is now so mor morally declined that the abuse is now a new sport it's a new football it's a new basketball and the people who play it are the power brokers to the extent and and you know, if there's a police, you can arrest me when I'm finished. <laughs> to the extent that some of the children that we now find in foster homes, certain foster homes, are fathered by these blokes, these power brokers, who sit in offices, who wear jacket and tie, who, who have big names. They are fathered by them. And because they are fathered by them, they send them to these homes for a kind of protection. There is a case now in London that is now dealing with a, a Dominican child that will probably be back in Dominica in July or September. About. The case will be in June, right? And you think about those things and you look at the wider implications. And, and I don't think we know, we, we have yet come to the reality of how, we, how much we are destroying the society. So, so a lot of the, the deviant behavior that we're getting, a lot of the promiscuity that we're seeing, uh, and, and I'm glad you mentioned it there, a lot of the behavior that's in the secondary schools and in the college and everywhere else, it, it, it is really a, a, a consequence, a result of that which these people have, have experienced, and, and, and it's, it's getting worse. And my question is, what do we do about it? Because viewing this film and getting the information is great, but I want something different. I want somebody to stand up and do something and say something. Just a few weeks ago, a certain young man was offered $20,000 just to shut him up. Please don't bring this to the public. Here is a stash of money, twenty thousand dollars. And you talk about poverty. You talk about people who who need more money. And this gentleman called me. He said, "Look, I need that money. You see, I'm at a point now where I'm broke. Yeah. What do you think I should do?" I said, "My brother, if you take that money, you go to hell." <laughs> twenty. I mean, I mean, that's serious. He's offered twenty thousand dollars just to shut up. Say. Nothing. Now, who have twenty thousand dollars to give somebody for that? Not me. You understand what I'm talking about? So, so we have gone past the the poverty in the father's home where he can't feed or the woman can't feed the children and, and the stepfather is. And I'm not saying that that's that that's right. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying no. This abuse thing has become a sport where some men think that they need to prey on the younger people, whether they're boys or girls. Right? For their own sport. What do we do about that? I I'm made, asking you the professional question. Help me, please. I made a reference earlier on, I think it was in the second slide, of social workers and they can perform in the way that they are supposed to, uh, to perform. You may not be able to absolutely get rid or eliminate levels of, of um, abuse and so on, but I believe there is a level of control. If, as a professional, you are out there to do your work, you do not have the support, you do not have the, the resources, you do not have the motivation, or you've lost that motivation to do it, I will wait on cases to come to me to deal with, rather than I go out. If it is seen, the public sees that something is happening, and we can stop some cases, and we can deal with some cases, people are going to think twice to do it. Without that institution where homes are very, very vulnerable that people can enter and do what they want, it's a serious problem. 
I've been to homes right here, not far, five minutes drive out of here, where a four-year-old baby is taking care of a nine-month-old baby. You know, I mean, and this person now has about 10 children, 11 children. I mean, I won't describe to you what she does and so on. There has to be some level of intervention when you have families or single mothers who have opted out of school early for whatever reason that we should have a social service that goes in and do this early intervention what social workers are taught to do. They will know where to get the other resources to back them up because they are the principal person who have that authority by law to intervene in a home if they have to. You don't have, you have four social workers covering the island. You have social workers doing probationary work, purpose allowance work, and all kind of things. I come from an environment where those duties are, are segregated duties, and it is very specific, and each of them have their role to play. We have not reached there yet, and I've been talking about this now for years. So that is not a priority. So when, all, when some other service takes over the role of the social worker and the probation worker, and the purpose allowance you're giving is so proper that you can get higher money elsewhere. That eliminates the role of the social worker to go in and do an assessment and to begin doing what you call the social history, the family history, and having a plan where you need to get to, at least to get the child to school. You start based on the family, a six months plan. You give them that comfort that they have the confidence to take responsibility of their lives where families can support. But that is eroded. And it is, it is at the bottom here ready to just hit hard. And, on, and it's going to take some time to get it back up there because professionals will not be able to work in that environment. And it is creating a problem. But, but, but Francis, don't you think that, that that will deliberately remain that way? Because some people love it that way. Do so, you think that the society must now take on its own and shout and scream and cry because, because those who have the pockets, right, and who have the power will not want eight social workers or 15 social workers because four social workers is just sufficient. It's doing the job very well. In a bad way, yes. But of course. So, so you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So from an institutional standpoint, we ain't going to go anywhere fast. Right, so we're on the same page. We need a Kamala down here from Trinidad. Um, <laughs> Francis, let me thank you. Yeah. And Stan, for an extraordinary job. Yeah. Um, I'm expecting nothing less, actually. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think Randy's question is the question that is on my mind. When I listen to Ayola, who is my daughter, not my biological daughter, but my daughter. I care for her like a daughter. And when I recall the stories that were told to me just last night, I had the privilege of being given the oral history of, the, of Rosso families by an 83-year-old woman who can tell you the history of Rosu based on who was having children with whom, who lived there, and she can point to the houses where these honorable gentlemen used to send their children to be raised by nannies and so on, but in homes that they carefully selected to be sure that their children were actually going to be raised in their traditions and not in the traditions of the mothers. <laughs> I, I say that because between Iola and that 83-year-old woman, <coughs> all of us are sitting. She's a young woman, and there was this older woman last night. Randy, you and I know the answer to your question, you know. <laughs> we have to make a loud noise. A noise so loud, so incessant, so annoying, 
that you will force people to dance to that music. And it works. Ask Triple K. <laughs> ask ask WCK. They make a loud noise and they force everybody within hearing distance of them to move to their music. We have to do that, Randy. We have to do it in a way that strikes the fear of God into, into the perpetrators. We have to do it in a way that we are not afraid to name them. And if our daughters tell us who they are, we will name them. That is what we have to do. How can it be that people who today sit in positions of policy leadership in our country can be fathering children with 17 year olds? Something happened when that child was 16. We know who they are. You can go to Bishle and find one. You can go to Shirodel and find another. And I can name the other villages. These are children. You see that last word on that slide, futile? That's the trigger word, Francis. That word must disappear mm -hmm. from, from your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Because it must be possible for us to save our children. The first thing we have to do is claim them as ours. I don't care who the child is. Any <coughs> child in this country has to be claimed by all fathers, all parents of this country as theirs. And if we see and know of people, either in our generation or other generations, abusing those children, we have to call them out. Yeah. I don't think social work can do it. Yeah. The only thing that can do it is the power. You see that, that group you found, P-O-W-A? I yeah. love that. Antigua. That's the only thing that can do it. Unfortunately, she passed away a couple of years ago. Yeah. Stress, anxiety, yeah. whatever. But I just say this because there are people in yeah. this room, and we all know other people who have been abused, yeah. you know, as children. We will not stop it by talking soft. And I'm deliberately talking soft. <laughs> we will only yeah. stop it. Tomorrow when I call Randy Rodney's program, Rand Randy will have to use the, what Angelo calls it? The stop button because I am going to say a few things. Ozzy Lewis said tonight on a sports program, the best defense against libel is truth. I'm going to speak some of that truth tomorrow on Randy's program. You see him there? La Gelango. Yeah. It is about time. One final observation. In 2009, there was a report, the Country Poverty Assessment Updated Report. Chapter 13 in that report should be read by everybody because it identifies the phenomenon that you are addressing here and it calls it the underground economy yeah. and it identifies the areas in the country where people are engaged in transactional sex themselves or with their children where there's a room in the house designated for that activity which is to generate income through sexual activity that is paid for, prostitution. And it's happening in poor households, in not so poor households, and in well-off households in Dominica. That is in an official government report. Take away that word, futile. We're going to fix that. No problem. <laughs>